Well, good evening and welcome to the kitchen of Ringstead Court, somewhere I have been spending altogether far too much time over the last two months. Um, I am Danny, thank you very much to Phil of the SRFC for the invitation. And you may know me from such previous works as, says fuck too much, Echo Rising. The book which I am going to be reading from in a moment, this is Echo Burning, the second in the series. The third is Echo Endgame, and thank you Marvel, I got there first. Um, you can see actually the original map, you get a, a chuckle out of this. There is a classic fantasy map in the front of Echo Burning, and that actually on the thing behind me there, that is the original, that is the map from which it was taken. Um, also up there are my two central characters from... Children of Artifice, uh, illustration by Erika Sampaio, book published by Fox Spirit Books. I have to say, I am particularly proud of this. So it was a story of long time in the making and I was really quite chuffed with the way it came out. But you may know me from the slightly more high profile Augusta Santoris, bless her cotton socks, Order of the Bloody Rose. And if anybody had told me when I was younger that I would wound up wind up writing Warhammer fiction, I would have chortled my arse off, but hey, there you go. Um, yeah, the last two months have been very, very strange. It's very odd not being a part of the office I work in and of seeing everything that FP does. You know, it all keeps coming up on my Twitter stream and everything else, and I can't do anything about it, I can't touch it, I'm not allowed to go anywhere near it. And it's all very strange. I've been down here at FP for such so long, for such a long time, that being without it has left me feeling slightly rootless. But the other, um, the advantage is it's given me a chance to catch up on my reading. Uh, if you don't know Wikdiv, I can highly recommend it. Um, I, what else have I been reading? I've been reading, finally catching up on the last Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, starting a saga I began reading when I was 14, 15, and I fell absolutely hook, line and sinker in love with the land as a teenager. Read them over and over and over again. And finally, reading the last book, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, just had me in floods. You know, when you've loved something for that long and you finally had to say goodbye. If anybody remembers the very end of the Chronicles of Narnia, when Aslan says to Peter, Peter shut the door, had exactly the same effect. Just made me absolutely bawl my eyes out, though I was a lot younger then. Um, what else have I been reading? I have finished um, Aliette's wonderful series, uh, Dominion of the Fallen. The last book of that was absolutely glorious, particularly fond of Asmodeus particularly fond of Asmodeus, I rather liked him. Um, I've also been rereading um, Richard Morgan's Steel Remains, three books, I'm about halfway through the last one. It's going to come to something when Ringgill is comfort reading, but hey, you know, they're books that definitely, definitely need to be read more than once. I think I previously had them on audio, and there is so much going on in every paragraph, every sentence. There's so much history, so much politics, that actually they take reading, reading in print a second time to really make the most out of them. Um, yeah, you'll forgive me, I absolutely hate doing this. But for my reading this time, I'm going to steer away from the book that says fuck too much. Um, and I'm going to start with the prologue of the second Echo series. You don't really need much backdrop to this. Um, Echo himself is a foul-mouthed, hard-biting, hard-snarling cyberpunk character who pretty much gets picked up by the scruff of his neck, dumped in a classic fantasy world and told, you are its hero, you know, you need to take, you, you need to save this. And needless to say, he goes like, fuck do I, and buggers off into the wide blue yonder, gets into all sorts of trouble. Um, by the beginning of the second book, he's sort of starting to learn that he can't actually buck his responsibilities, and he's got to sort out his shit. But this doesn't deal with Echo. This, in fact, introduces the major bad guy, not only for the book, but for the series. So there we go, the prologue for Echo Burning. She'd walked their halls of decadence with wonder. Now she leaned out over the parapet, breathing in the sunlight, the salt air, like amazement. They watched her through their shared eye, their curiosity whetted and mutual. But how do you do this stuff? She turned to face them, bright with attitude. She was defiant, mischievous, confrontational. Does anyone know? The great library? The bard? Anticipation cut through them both, savage and immediate. I want her. I want no denial was absolute. I'm not giving you one this young. She's mine. You know why. The creature in his soul slabbered at him, hungry. I said no. Ice cold, he forced it down. 
The count of time has brought her here for good reason. It glowered at him for a moment, considering, then fell silent. Patience, he told it. He turned back to the girl, laughing with her. I have all the company I need, he said, amused. I own as my home. Everything's here. My work, my art, my life. It's quiet here. I don't want it invaded. He joined her, age-spotted hands on worn pastel stone. Beneath his skin, ink writhed. Marks he could never lose slid across his fingers and circled his wrists like serpents. When he turned to look at her, one eye seeing, the other, the dark one, covered, she caught her breath. Shah, he said her name with affection. You've seen only the beginning. His gaze caught hers, held it. Would you like to see more? You can't have anything else. Her laugh was casual, thrown away by clean sea wind. Blue water dashed into whiteness on rocks far below. Why are you even out here? Ah, little one, so many questions. Her lips were parted, her very coloured eyes shone. He liked her eyes, one blue, one green. They were unusual, they'd caught his interest like a portent. He thought he might keep them. Come, he said. Light flooded the high garden, the stone cloisters. A glitter of autumn leaves hung from the pergolet and danced in the breeze. This time she stared more at the scatter of creatures, his menagerie, his creations and artworks. He walked with purpose and she occasionally ran to keep pace, her feet swift on patterned mosaic. Dapples of sun slid over her skin. What are they for? she asked. Themselves? he gave her an amused shrug. Me? I like them. They have a good home here. They passed across the shadow of a statue. A creature of hooves and horns loomed above them. But why don't you let them go? To what end? He raised his one eyebrow. Freedom isn't a gift to one who can't use it. She frowned at him. He pushed open a door. Here. Yes, draw her in. Make her be silent. The room was dim, shelves heavy with books. He let her wonder, her fingers trailing over their spines. Somewhere in his heart, the creature hissed with heat and helpless fury. Let me taste her, or I will rend your insides to bloody shreds. I will tear myself free of your flesh, rip down the skies and rain death on this accursed rock. Peace, your melodrama bores me. I'll bring you what you need in time. You wait until I say. I starve, you perish. Where is your learning then? I won't let you starve. He laughed again, and the girl turned to look at him, soft in the grey air. Come here, he said gently. She came, still cocky as she laid a hand on his shoulder. Her chin tilted sideways, assumption and invitation. For a moment he allowed himself to be charmed by her brazenness. The creature in him trembled, and the blade opened her throat. A single slash, a red line, a ripping, widening smile. A flood of rich darkness that covered his hands concealed the ever-moving sigils. He caught her as she fell, bubbles on her lips and a final look of shock in those strange two-coloured eyes. He was sorry to waste her this way, but he, they, sought answers. As if those eyes were a harbinger, a warning from the count of time itself, they sought answers now. They laid her out on the stone floor, her life running forgotten to the sea far below. A single blow shattered her sternum. It took the strength of the creature within him to crack her ribcage and part the two sides like doors, tearing her open to reach the truth that lay within. Her lungs fluttered, her heart beat desperately, struggled, and was still. The creature in him pulsed with blood and eagerness, his skin bulged to contain it. Slowly he raised a bloodied hand and lifted the covering on his darker eye. Tell me, he said silently, tell me what you have seen. It repulsed his clinical nature, but his need for knowledge was absolute, foolish. It was laughing, the sound immortal and terrible. The world is wounded, riven to her heart, and now a canker spreads through her flesh. Despite Malgrim's failure, Roviareth will fall to her knees. Favion lies trembling, her pale thighs wide. Old forces muster at Ramoth, they've waited so long, and the bard is gone. The creature paused. What? Ineffectual, his presence or his absence matter not. Its scorn was like a blade, it severed his consciousness, thought from thought. Under the full onslaught of its presence, he could barely remember who he was. Even as it spoke, it pried into his mind with hot, curious fingers, bearing his innermost weaknesses, laughing at his doubts and fears. One day, it would tear his soul to screaming shreds. But not today. Tell me what you've seen, he demanded. I know that the world has found eyes, it said, sounding faintly amused. 
but they're crazed and broken and she struggles to focus, to mesh thought and memory once more. It paused. He found he had to stare at the girl, blood congealing on her skin. And I've seen something new, something different. It was peaked, he'd never heard it sound so curious. Something that had might enough to thwart Malgrim's growth. Something dark, cruel, tortured. Something insane, something that walks as though in a maze of its own mind and something that... The creature caught itself. Something that you'll want, my Estava, my brother. Something that may hold the key to the greatest knowledge of all. The creature could not suppress its hunger. It flooded the man's mouth like warm red wine. He swallowed. You cannot fool me. The want is yours. What are you withholding from me? He pushed back, demanding. How does the world find her vision, seek her memory? What has happened to the bard? It laughed at him then, displaying a cruelty and power so vast he found himself shuddering physically, backing away from the torn open corpse of the girl. Ah, my old friend, it said. Do you not trust me even now? The girl's head turned. He thought he saw her exposed lungs inflate, her bloodied lips make words. Trust me, she mouthed silently. Trust. He dropped the covering over the eye. The girl was still, ripped open like a boyo's uneaten kill. She'd not moved. You seek ultimate comprehension, the creature said, its tone enticing. A dark charisma that teased sweat from his shoulders. This man believes he has it. You should bring him to us, my friend, my captor. Struggling, he said nothing thought nothing. Mind empty, he stared down at the girl. Her eyes were open, that look of shock still on her face. She'd given them answers, but raised only more questions. Seabirds cried as if in mourning. The breeze rattled the shutters. He shivered. The creature was hiding something, something he couldn't touch. It was laughing at him, and yet he needed to know, had to know. Aloud, he said, that walks as though in a maze of its own mind. The words echoed hollow in the silence between them. The girl cooled on the floor. Bring him, it said. Coax him, make him come to us. He cannot be broken, but he is in need of a mentor, a father, and you can make him trust you. Why do you care, creature? What do you want? I, the creature was grinning, a white slash of savagery in the darkness, somewhere. Embers smouldered in yellow eyes. Trust me, my Estava. The greatest knowledge requires the greatest risk. Bring Echo to Iona, tear him wide, and you will craft the greatest creations of your life. One of the things about Echo is that he doesn't know where he is. He believes that he is situated in essentially a gaming program. Um, I called it a virtual Rorschach, and it's essentially a psychoanalyst a psychoanalysis program that he is being put through in order to assess and to heal his mind. And he's an angry, spiky, foul-mouthed little man and he doesn't really want his mind healed. <laughs> yeah, so he spends an awful lot of his time basically refusing to do what he's told, swearing a lot and generally getting himself into trouble. It's a hell of a saga. It took me a very, very long time to write. And I have to say, I'm kind of pleased with the way it turned out. I mean, it's been a while since I finished it, but going back to it, even now, going back to those characters, a lot of them I've never managed to leave behind, Ran particularly. I've never managed to actually give up. Um, and if you are, if you have read the trilogy and you're curious as to what happens next, the first five or six chapters of the fourth book, Echo Legacy, which is actually told from the point of view of Lugan, who is Echo's cyberpunk mentor. And he's a, a hard-bitten, hard-biting cyberpunk biker, except Lugan's like in his 50s. So he's he has basically been there, seen it, done it. You know, he's not angry. He's not spiky. He's just wellard and knows it and has nothing to prove. You can find that up on Curious Fictions um, and you can catch up with the rest of the story.